I am here just to welcome you on behalf of the foundation and introduce someone who I met yesterday but uh, didn't recognize because he's a lot more laid back than I expected, which was nice. He, in addition to being a laid back guy, is the uh, Vice President of Policy for the Council of the Americas and is the Editor-in-Chief of Americas Quarterly and he is the reason we are here in El Paso today to launch the magazine, Brian Winter.
a kind of integration of cultures and families as well, something that I personally think has been really positive for both countries. What we're here to do today is to essentially build on some of the things that are discussed in this issue. It's to look at the truth and to try to understand better what is really happening, both at the street level and in the halls of power in D.C. I'm sure that at some points today, uh, the, you know, the discussion will get a little charged, uh, which I think is natural, because these are important issues that really touch on a lot of people's lives, their family lives, their economic lives, their, their, their livelihood. But my hope today is that we can also um, shed more light than me. I'm hoping that we can send everybody out here with a better understanding of what's happening, not only here in the two communities that live side by side, but also in uh, Washington and in Mexico City and that dynamic of what's happening between the two governments right now. So uh, with that, thank you again for all, to all of you for being here. And I'd like to invite our panelists to the stage. Well, briefly, let me just do brief introductions. Uh, to my left, um, Keren Antebi, who's the economic counselor. Oh, I'm sorry, you're down there. I, 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 did we before switch? even, did you guys Maybe. look at the? Oh, that is there. oh well. <laughs> it's okay. We can change names. I'll be a judge for a day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Veronica Escobar, who's an El Paso uh, County judge. Um, John Barella, the CEO for the Borderplex Alliance. Karen Antebi, who's the economic counselor for the Trade and NAFTA Office of the Embassy of Mexico. Uh, Alfredo Corchado, an award-winning journalist, author, and Mexico bureau chief of the Dallas Morning News. And Paul Foster, who's the founder and former executive chairman of Western Refining Incorporated and a member of the board of directors of Endeavor. And we'd also like to make a special note that uh, Alejandro de la Vega, uh, who is the head of the Innovation and Economic Development Department of Chihuahua State, was unable to join us because of, um, essentially because of travel issues. But we, we, we thank her for her contributions to today's event as well. So for my first question, I'd like to ask this of the whole panel, just as kind of by way of introduction. What is the biggest misconception in Washington today about the border region and about the U.S.-Mexico relationship more broadly. And Karen, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Veronica, I was hoping we could start with you. That, wow, that's a, that's a big question because there are innumerable misconceptions about the U.S.-Mexico border, about El Paso, about Mexico. Um, you know, one of the things that has been very challenging for our community and our region has been fighting back against many of those misconceptions because they're very harmful. So we have had politicians, I recall Rick Perry, when he was running for president the first time, was um, said during the presidential debate, the Republican presidential debate, that there were bombs going off in El Paso. And he was at the time the governor of the state of Texas. And that was just patently false. And the challenge for us is not just battling the misconceptions, but even when you have corrected the record, even when you describe to politicians and to other folks from other parts of the country that the border is safe, that it's a place of opportunity and economic vibrancy, that our relationship with Mexico is a huge positive, many times they are simply unwilling to accept the facts. And you can present the facts directly to them and it won't matter. And, and that has been very troubling and very challenging. I think that's true, and you know, one of the things that we tried to do in this issue, but that events like this are good for as well, permit me, is I think you need human faces and human stories out there too, because people identify more with those sometimes than cold, hard, numerical facts about economics or crime or, or whatever. That's true, but even when presented with the human stories, you know, you, you, we, can, we can talk, for example, 
about the wall in rational terms and talk about the fact that it will not stop the illegal drug trade as long as there's a demand on the American side. Um, you know, and, and we're suffering through through tremendous issues all over the country with opioid ab abuse. And um, so, so you can paint a human face and you can say, look, it's th this wall is not going to stop it. There's people that are still dying in your neighborhoods, in your backyard, and in your districts. Um, but it is, it, it's become just an easy uh, political backdrop. Drop. And so you'll have sometimes politicians who will actually fly in to border communities for photo ops um, and will put on like the whole gear, like you know, sort of this military gear, in order to appear like they're being tough on crime. You rarely see them come into El Paso that way because we are so safe. But they 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 choose their backdrop wisely in order to pursue the agenda. And the agenda is promoting fear so that they can be seen as the guardian or the savior who's going to save us from the big bad border or from migrants, et cetera. John, the, the issues that, that Veronica has just laid out here, I mean, I, what sort of impact do you think that's all having on the, on the business community right now? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Eric, for hosting us uh, here at the El Paso Community Foundation. Brian, congratulations. You have a first class uh, publication and enjoy reading it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here on behalf of the Porterplex region. Um, we are a, an advocacy and economic development organization that's very unique. The only one that we're aware of that's privately funded that represents two countries in three states, Ciudad Juarez, El Paso County, and southern New Mexico. I agree with the judge. There are many, many misconceptions about the border region, but the number one uh, misconception in my opinion is that the rest of the country views this as a violent and lawless frontier. And I totally agree with the judge as well. You can provi provide data, but often the data is misunderstood or isn't believed. El Paso is, in fact, and has been for many, many years, the safest city of its size in the United States. Southern New Mexico, the violent crime rate last year dropped in the Las Cruces MSA by 9%, while the violent crime rate across the country rose by 4%. Ciudad Juarez, in Ciudad Juarez, per 100,000 residents and per capita, the homicide rate in 2016 was in fact less than St. Louis, less than Baltimore, less than New Orleans, less than Detroit, and yes, less than Birmingham, Alabama, the home of our Attorney General who was here uh, and, and flew in. And, and not to politicize this in any way, but it has a dramatic impact on business, Brian. I mean, in my prior job as Economic Development Secretary for the state of New Mexico, when we were pushing trade with Mexico along Santa Teresa, Every single time we were trying to get a company to move, and we had 38 announcements in the end, which is good, but every single time, virtually every single time, people ask questions like, well, is it safe? Is our family going to be safe? Uh, but when we were locating and trying to locate businesses further north in the state, we didn't get that question very often, despite the data which proved that those other communities were very much more crime ridden than our area. So here's the bottom line. These misconceptions have two very bad corollaries to them, two bad results. This perception that we are a violent, lawless place, number one, it manifests itself into national policies that can be destructive to our local economy. And secondly, the perception with those who aren't familiar with our, our safe streets here and our, 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 our absolute respect for one another is that it limits our economic development opportunities because many companies that would love to locate here because of our value proposition and our productive workforce, our hard work, hard working workforce won't give us a second look because of the fact that they think that we're unsafe. They don't even look at us. So that's what we have to push back on, rescript that narrative, tell people the truth, and continue fighting forward with that message. 
thank you. Um, let me pass this down to, to Karen, just so you guys can, can hear a little better. Um, Karen, you're sort of on the tip of the spear at this point in the Mexico trade office there in Washington, D.C. And so I, I asked this same question about the biggest misconception regarding the border to you with kind of, I'm very curious to hear your response on what you're hearing there in D.C. and maybe how that's evolving over the last few months. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Let's see if, does this work? No. Or do I have to stay with this one? Thanks. Kind of funny. Drop the mic. Um, <laughs> I had to do that. Um, I would first like to thank you for being, for inviting me here, and can only echo what uh, my co-panelists have already said. I think that there is a huge misperception of what the border is um, and, and how integrated the border is, really, um, in terms of its, its values, in terms of its family units, in terms of its culture, in terms of its um, productive activity. Um, you know, Texas is Mexico's number one trading partner, and, and El Paso alone, you know, has a huge exports to the order of 42 billion, and nearly half of that goes to Mexico. And there's, a, there's, a, I feel there is a misconception with regards to how productive and how economically vibrant this region is when what you see in the media and what you see on TV is something that is very different of a lawlessness frontier. Um, the way that El Paso and the Ciudad Juarez community interacts together to produce goods for world markets is remarkable. They clearly are at the top of the sphere in multiple manufacturing sectors. So whether we look at, at electronics or whether we look at automotive or we look at um, oil and gas and other sectors, clearly the businesses that are here are doing well and they're doing well because they work together. So part of the role that we have is how do we bring this up? How do we present it? And I feel that your local and your state representatives at the federal level clearly are aware of it. The challenge is how do we bring that up north? Well, I want to get to that and maybe maybe put that question a little bit to Alfredo because, you know, Alfredo, you've been covering the border region for, for many years and you're familiar with what things are actually like here. You're also a guy who's spent considerable times in places like D.C. and and look, I mean, I, we've, we've established already sort of a certain, I think we're, there's a consensus about the fact that there's all this misconception, but let me complicate things a bit. Thank you. <laughs> um, people in DC are not stupid. There's something else going on here. And so, you know, Alfredo, let me put the question to you. I mean, what, what do you think is really going on and, and how do you see it playing out here and what do you think needs to be done to combat it? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Brian and Eric. Uh, it's great to be back home and thank you for uh, allowing me to, to have a story in the America's Quarterly this month. Uh, this is uh, sort of a, a cheap plug for the Dallas Morning News, but it's, it, and I'm, I'm back home and um, this is where I started my career as a journalist many, many years ago at the El Paso Herald Post. Uh, it's interesting, a few years ago we did a whole series in the morning news about the new border. And it was about trying to sort of introduce the border, border issues to places like Dallas and other places around Texas and the Southwest. Um, and since then we realized that that we haven't really done our job well. We haven't really covered the border. We haven't really told the border story. Uh, so as a journalist, I mean, it, uh, I'm going to be relocated uh, next month from Mexico City back to El Paso, and I'll be the uh, El Paso bureau chief along with Angela Cocharga, who's here and known to many of you. Uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity for us to be back and to try to tell these stories and to try to contribute to the, uh, the, 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 the narrative or the lack of narrative. I mean, I, whenever, 
I talk to people in the Northeast, whether it's DC um, or New York City. I think El Paso, I think Laredo, I think uh, many other cities, especially uh, Texas and Arizona, are seen as political piñatas. You know, it's easy to hit them, and there's no real punchback. Uh, and that's something that I think will only change with, uh, with more political engagement, uh, more people voting, more people interested, more people engaged, and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, there are a lot of, uh, as, as John and Vemeka were saying, I mean, the, the big issue for us over the last few years has been safety, security. Uh, on the Mexican side, we always try to stress how safe it is on the U.S. side. But I think we need to tell the stories in a different level, and, I, and especially these days with uh, what's going on, you know, the, 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 the national debate, uh, it's not just facts anymore. And I agree, uh, Veronica, it's, it's facts, but it's also trying to even humanize it even more. I mean, it's all about storytelling and trying to tell stories and trying to connect with the national audience. So, uh, it, it's a tall, tall challenge, and, uh, and I hope to. Uh, I look forward to seeing many of you back uh, next month. Paul, if I, I may ask you a, again a variation on the same question. One of the going to Alfredo's point. One of the things that I've heard and that we've heard. We were in Mexico City two weeks ago, and we did a big launch event similar to this in some ways in New York back in May. And one thing that we heard a couple people say was that the business community and the sort of the forces who favor integration, whether it means at the economic level or the cultural level, have not been vocal enough in talking about, for example, the benefits of trade or the benefits of immigration. And, you know, the facts are out there. I mean, the only, I say this as I'm 39, and the only thing that's going to save us my generation, with the baby boomers retiring in coming years, is the demographic improvement in the young people that only immigration can bring and to some level has brought over the last 30 years. I mean, do you think that there's more that the private sector and communities like this can do in general in order to essentially give a more full-throated defense of trade and immigration and integration overall? I, I do think there's a lot more that we can do. Uh, by the way, thank you for, for having me. Um, the, we're doing quite a bit, and forums like this are very helpful. Uh, the things that, that John and the Waterplex Alliance are doing are very, very helpful, and we've become much more engaged in this process um, through this last election cycle as, as the rhetoric has, has, has increased. Um, and I think there's a lot more that the business community can do. I don't, I, you know, I don't think we need to protest or anything else. I think we just need to make our voices heard. We need to make sure that our politicians understand. Um, and, and, and that includes some politicians that, that you would think already would understand, but don't necessarily. I'm not going to call them out, but, uh, you know, some, you could just think that, that they would get it already, but they don't. And uh, so I think it's important for us to, to beat the drum as, as much as we can. Um, and, and, and you asked about perceptions on the border. I mean, I think that most people that don't live on the border believe, again, because of the recent rhetoric, uh, they believe that the border is open, that people can just kind of come back and forth as much as they want. They believe that Mexico drops its criminals off at the, at the border, and then we open the door and let them in. And, you know, those are things, that's very, very harmful. And, but those are things that, I mean, they believe it because they were told those things. And they're just patently not true. And um, it's unfortunate. And it's up to us to correct those misperceptions. Well, and thank you for that. And thanks to all of you. I mean, there's a perception out there that, again, that facts don't matter. But actually, we saw a case in the last, I guess it was about a month and a half ago now, where on the day that President Trump was supposedly going to give notification of his intent to potentially exit from the deal, the, agri the Secretary of, you'll know this, the Secretary of Agriculture and the Commerce Secretary went into his office with the map 
of jobs that could potentially be lost if the U.S. exited NAFTA. And he reconsidered. So, you know, that to me speaks to the fact that maybe, maybe facts are not totally out of fashion yet. But there have been some worrying signs these last couple weeks. I mean, I, I think for those of us who, who believe in that integration, especially at the economic level, I think there's a sense that, um, you know, it's sometimes easier to think of these things as, as in terms of names and in terms of people. And it's not just White House intrigue. It kind of shows you which philosophies are ascendant. There's a, a belief grounded in fact that, that Steve Bannon and his group, which is kind of more nationalist, is ascendant again. And that could potentially play out in the NAFTA negotiations, among other things. And let me ask, um, let me ask Karen, uh, what do you, where are we headed with this? I mean, can, what's the most update to, up-to-date information that you can give us on kind of the state of play and the talks between both countries? And what's your own personal expectation uh, for where we'll go in the next six months or so? Actually, just if you'll permit me a brief plug here, it also happens to be on page 42 of the magazine. <laughs> Mexico and Canada to 
to upgrade the agreement, which is a, a much better phrasing and rhetoric than what was previously presented. And this comment period is open for 90 days. In about 60 or 30 days before we enter formal negotiations, the United States has to publicly um, publish the objectives of the negotiations. So we will all know by July. And I guess from the Mexico's perspective, and I feel from Canada's perspective, although they're not here, we're pretty much ready uh, to engage with our North American partners. We, we have been working together throughout this period. We know each other. There are very deep uh, channels of communications among both governments at all levels. And so now we just start waiting to see what is it that the United States really wants to get out of this. So what I hear, just quickly, is it sounds like we're getting ready to talk about talking. Is that accurate? We're ready to see where is it that we want to land the ship, right? Where, where do we want to take this? Uh, we feel clearly from Mexico's point of view and our goal when entering the Trans-Pacific no negotiation was we're looking to strengthen North America, to strengthen our supply chains and to compete in world markets. So everything and anything that we do is geared towards making a strong and competitive North America. And, and Brian, what I want to just let everyone know about, Karen mentioned this 90-day period. And during the 90-day period, there is public comment. And what we really have to do as border communities is we have to use that period to offer strong um, public comment as unified as we possibly can. That you, one of your questions was, um, you know, about, um, like, you know, how, how did we get here and, and what do we do? We, we really do have to assert ourselves far more especially during this administration. And communities like El Paso, we, we have much to lose, obviously, if NAFTA is reworked, if we have a NAFTA 2.0 that doesn't work for us. And so the business community, you, you had asked Paul about, you know, how engaged is the business community. And I think more than just the business community, I think advocates also, because the human rights advocates and labor organizations as well, in addition to the business community, we all should provide as much input as possible and utilize that 90 days. There will also be a public hearing. And if we can organize ourselves well enough to really be present and offer a unified message and, and a, um, really a significant one from other communities across the border, we may not change the outcome. The outcome may already be somewhat prescriptive, but it is important to let the country know what those of us who are on the front lines believe would be the best outcome for NAFTA 2.0. Just quickly, I want to go back to Karen, but you know, there are, I hear stories and I talk with people who say that they're eager to do that kind of thing, but they want to do it in a way that's not partisan. They want to do it in a way that doesn't get, you know, sort of caught up in this, uh, you know, larger conflict between Republicans and Democrats. Is there, is there a way to do that? You know, we, the, we have an example, I think, um, in both our members of Congress. Um, Representative Beth O'Rourke and Representative Will Hurd very frequently put aside their partisan background to work together for the benefit of the border. Um, Congressman Hurd, for example, will bring his fellow Republicans to the border. And he's, he's the member of Congress that represents the biggest swath of the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, you know, he and I are of different political parties, but I really appreciate the way that he tries to tell the story. So does Congressman O'Rourke very eloquently and very frequently. But it's not just up to the actual politicians, 
it's it's up to the the Paul Fosters, it's up to the John Barellas, it's up to you know the other advocates that I see in the audience. And by the way, thanks to all of you for coming out and for wanting to engage and and to ask questions, but there are very diverse views in the audience, just looking out in the audience, human rights views, labor views, business views. Um, we all need to have a stake in this, and, and it will be partisan, whether we want it to be or not. But I think that um, we have to seize on this 90-day period and not be passive. So just to add to the 90-day period, the deadline to submit comments is June 12th. So I clearly urge each and every one of you. Does everybody take out a piece of paper and write your comments? Right, and, and, and it's not that hard. I mean, you can actually just go to the doc and type them in. Um, so the experiences, the personal experiences, for large, for small, for medium-sized businesses, how do we make this better? What is it that works? Um, and to be perfectly honest, you know, given the political calendars, there's got to be a determination of what the scope of the negotiation is going to be. And, and that is an element that I think at some point we should address. So Karen referred to NAFTA as a marital contract. <clears throat> and the thing about marriages is that sometimes they end in divorce. And, um, you know, things, this relationship that we're describing between the United States and Mexico for all the talk, which has been very sincere about the integration and the understanding between both communities, it is not a given that that relationship will be strong. It should not be taken for granted. And actually, as a matter of fact, if you look at the sort of longer arc of history between Mexico and the United States, the last 30 years have been the exception. I mean, really as recently as the 70s and 80s, the relationship, especially at the government to government level, was often quite antagonistic. And then, of course, you can go back into the 19th century and find all kinds of horrors, which we won't get into today, just to sort of keep it simple. But my, my question is for, for John and Paul. I mean, in your communities, how much risk or how much fear do you hear about the possibility of something really, if not divorce, some real potentially catastrophic downgrade in that trading and business and kind of bilateral relationship. A few months ago, I think the skies were pretty gloomy. Lots of clouds swirling, it looked pretty stormy. Uh, today, I, I think it looks a lot more sunny, quite frankly, and I'm, I'm very optimistic that, uh, to use the analogy of uh, marital vows, I think we're going to renew the vows <laughs> and hopefully have a stronger union. Uh, and, I, and I believe that's where we're heading. If you saw the um, most recent developments that occurred in Washington, I think you can't help but be believe that we're heading in the right direction, uh, despite the rhetoric that had taken place months ago. 48 hours ago, you had the respective secretaries of the economy, basically Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of the Economy in Mexico, uh, de-escalating the sugar trade uh, crisis that was developing between the two countries. You also had uh, several principles uh, surrounding NAFTA that was announced by uh, our government, the U.S. government, essentially stating principles that was do no harm. Uh, swiftness in getting the renegotiation done, having the business community being at the table uh, in, in helping this, as well as other, other voices, and then finally modernizing and strengthening the agreement so that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of new jobs could be created by this, this 1994 uh, agreement, which according to the Wilson Center created between five and six million jobs. But it's important to point out, you know, we're here on the border. And this is a critical point. We're here on the border. So much focus is on the southern border. We all know that we have another border with Canada. And it's often forgotten, both from a security standpoint and from an economic standpoint sometimes. But the critical point is that we all know the economic integration that occurs between our community in the borderplex region and Mexico. It's second nature to all of us. The second most reliant state in the entire country 
on Mexican trade behind Texas is Michigan. 138,000 jobs are directly tied to trade with Mexico in Michigan. A very well integrated automotive supply chain drives that number. But Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, all states that Mr. Trump won account for almost 500,000 jobs that are directly tied to Mexico. And it's really important for us, and this is what we're doing at the Borderplex Alliance and other businesses, to really align ourselves with that area of the country and explain why NAFTA is so important. And not only to us, of course, but to the entire country, and indeed, all three countries. So that's why I'm optimistic. I think people are starting to get it. Uh, a lot of people are speaking up. Uh, and I think in the end, we're gonna wind up with a modernized and strengthened NAFTA that will, uh, will benefit uh, all three countries. At least I'm optimistic at this point now. I don't know that things could change. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's right. right. Now. But right now, as of this moment, I feel a lot better uh, than I did several months ago. Could change the tweet. Paul, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I mean, I echo what, what John said. I, I, you know, whenever, you know, right after the election, we kind of mobilized, and, and a lot of us have, have we've had a, a, a number of meetings, conference calls. We, we all flew to McAllen and, you know, kind of got together with our, with our, uh, our friends there from both sides of the border and started kind of talking about, you know, what's our strategy going to be? And, and, and I think we've been somewhat effective. I mean, the whole idea, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's about communication and making sure that, that people away from the border understand the story uh, as well as we do. And so, you know, I think uh, John's right. I think the rhetoric is, is much better now. Uh, I, I think the, the fear factor in, in Mexico is much better. You can look at the valuation of the peso to see how kind of how the business community maybe maybe views things. It's kind of back to pre-election levels, um, and and so I, I think I don't think there's any reason to to, to panic uh, right now. But I think we have a lot of work to do. I think there is a lot of risk uh, both to the business community and to just the overall uh, relationship between the two countries uh, if if we don't get this thing right. And I think we have an opportunity to improve NAFTA, uh, you know, and, and, and hopefully that's, that's where we'll end up with, with this process. Thank you. You know, Alfredo, this perspective from the business world is an important part of the equation, but of course there's many other ways to look at bilateral at the bilateral relationship and the relationship between Mexicans and Americans, and you've been traveling a lot in both countries uh, because you're working on a new book, um, which I hope I didn't just completely ruin the secret on that by telling the group that. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the what do you perceive on the ground? I mean, has there been greater tensions between the two countries because of what's transpired in D.C. and elsewhere over the last year, or do you see more communities that, that kind of understand that occasionally there are these these berinches, right, like these eruptions of, of political conflict. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting, because you know, I've been thinking about that uh, the, the last couple of weeks. I, I've been traveling a lot to uh, the, the Midwest, I spent some time in Iowa, Nebraska, uh, in, in part for, for this book that I'm working on, but also 20 years ago we did a whole series in the, in the Dallas Morning News called uh, the remaking of the face of America. And we wanted to go back to some of these places and see what, what has uh, tra transpired in, in the last 20 years. Uh, it was interesting, last week I was in Nebraska and Iowa, and uh, I said I was from the border, I've lived in, also lived in Mexico City, and you know, the first thing was, you know, uh, are you safe? Uh, and about the wall, they, they were very surprised that uh, there's already a wall. Uh, in fact, none of the people I talked to uh, uh, realized that. Uh, and it kind of reminds me that uh, using the, the, the marital uh, metaphor, that it, uh, it is a marriage, uh, 
but it's loveless. Uh, maybe you can say that. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's lack of trust. Uh, and I think this, this whole rhetoric has made both sides sort of look at each other. It's, it's almost like a mirror, uh, looking at each other. And it was interesting talking to people in Iowa who were saying, uh, after, after we got over the wall and security and how safe it is, um, you know, where are the Mexicans? Why aren't more Mexicans coming? I think it's, it's beginning to kind of set in that, that the last great Mexican migration has come and gone. And people are beginning to understand uh, that they had it pretty well for the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, and, and there were labor shortages. At, at the hotel I, I was staying, uh, this woman said, uh, please apologize to the Mexicans on behalf of our president. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I thought that was, that was interesting. Um, and please tell them to come back and, and because we have a lot of jobs for them. So you are beginning to kind of see a, a, uh, a sort of recognition or, or a sense of a reality check and, and, and what are we doing. I mean, the, the same story you hear in Dallas, you hear in San Diego, you hear in Chicago. Where are the Mexicans? You know? And I, I think the day has come when Americans will finally miss the Mexicans. <laughs> so I'm just going to beg to differ for one second. I don't think it's a loveless marriage. I think it's, it's, it's a marriage where the parties are taken for granted. And so now we have, with as much of a big of a challenge that we have, it's a great opportunity to renew the vows. So in terms of where we would be going, with the negotiations, it's 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 not about going back and looking at your prenup. It's like like how many of you here are married? <laughs> if you come home and say, Hey hon, you know what? Let's go and revisit the prenup, I promise your bags will be on the door. But if you say, Hey hon, I've been thinking and I really think we should renew our vows, I think you're gonna get a very different reaction. So from where we stand, the government of Mexico, we've laid out three very important principles, which is one, a clear recognition of the benefits that the agreement has brought. Number two is no renegotiating the prenup. What we're doing is forward. So what I mean is we're not looking to raise tariffs, we're not looking at quantitative restrictions, we're not looking to restrict trade among us. We can look at opportunities as how to make us stronger and more competitive vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world economy. And there are delicate balances to be struck in certain sectors. And there are these great opportunities, whether it's in telecom services, digital economy, SOEs, SMEs, capacity building. I mean, there, there is quite a very deep agenda. And then the third point is obviously it's got to be a win-win-win. So, you notice I said three wins, right? We consider Canada part of the mix. So it is three countries. It's a trilateral agreement. And for obvious reasons, because as an integrated North America, you don't want a set of rules to govern one side of your relationship and a different set of rules to govern the other. It doesn't make business sense. Um, and so there, I won't monopolize. Let me ask one more question, and then I'd like to open things up to the audience. Um, let me, in my role as moderator, try to give a little bit of perspective, from our, the best I can, from the other side. And I'd like the, the panel to react um, in as much as they're comfortable doing so. I mean, you know, what if what's going on right now is not a backlash against any particular community on a national basis or on a racial basis. But what if it's just a reaction to a generation, essentially a huge demographic shift that took, took place over the course of a relatively short time, 30 to 40 years, when you saw massive growth in the Hispanic population in the United States and the Mexican population more specifically. And what's happening, is, and much of it was, you know, happened with people who did not have proper documents. And what's really happening right now is an effort to put a controlled stop to that. And what if on the economic side, it's just an effort to correct this $80 billion 
trade deficit, which has been reasonably consistent over the last 20 years of NAFTA and restore greater balance to that relationship. I mean, on both of those points, or whichever point you choose to address, what, what's, what's your response? Veronica. So that's an interesting way to frame it. And I've been, I have thought a lot about how we got here as a country. And everyone's made some really great points about why it, it is important to renegotiate and how it could potentially be better for both countries. But I have wondered about the root cause and the real reason. And, and let's say it's not those that, that you brought up. There definitely, I think, has been a failure in our country to adapt to change. And I think that has been um, part of what's been driving some of what has happened with regard to the, the rhetoric with, with, with NAFTA and with immigration. When I think back to when NAFTA was first initiated and first signed into law, and I lived in El Paso and, um, at that time, and there was some devastating, there were some devastating impacts. We, we had a lot of folks who it felt like almost overnight were out of work. And there was a scramble to access retraining dollars. And we really dropped the ball in the way that we retrained people. And it seemed like it took a really long time for the community to assess how we should recalibrate under NAFTA, but we did. El Paso did. And that, that I, I feel like our journey was somewhat unique and different from the way that the rest of the country has looked at and dealt with NAFTA. You know, you, uh, you will not hear a whole lot of El Paso and say, let's go back to you know, old school manufacturing where we're making jeans and washing jeans and, you know, you know and sewing jeans. You, you, you don't hear that from our community. From our community, you heard, you know, how do we become a logistics hub? How do we become a healthcare hub? How do we capitalize on the military? And it really forced El Pasoans to reevaluate where we were headed and how we were going to operate under NAFTA. And things are not perfect. And you know we still have low wages. We still are stagnant wages. There's still a lot of work we have to do. But we didn't do what some of the other communities in this country have done, which is say, let's go back. Let's go back to coal. Let's go back. We very much have looked forward. And so you know, I don't know if that was part of our isolation, or we had great leadership at the time that you know kind of shook us all awake and said, we, we've got to do this. But there's got to be some leadership at the national level as well, saying that you know, yes, while while you know we we want to take care of many of these jobs and we want to be very careful, but we've got to look forward. And so so politicians have capitalized on the insecurity that comes with NAFTA for other communities and the fear that comes with that. And um, you know, I, I think El Paso has provided a really great model in, in, in what to do. And I, I don't think I even answered your question. Sorry. <laughs> hey, no, you did. You did. You did. John. Yeah, I think, I think uh, put another way with your question is why the fear? Why the fear in Middle America? Why the fear around the country about uh, the issues that we're discussing tonight? And if I can just kind of bundle them into three categories. Uh, first, no doubt about it, the Rust Belt has lost a number of manufacturing jobs. I mean, that's the reality of an evolving economy. Uh, many of those jobs aren't coming back. But according to uh, a Ball, Ball State University study, Midwestern University, well over 80% of the job losses in the Rust Belt weren't due to trade imbalances, whether with China or Mexico or anyone else, it was in fact due to automation and efficiencies in pr producing things, which is actually a good thing because that usually means higher skills, higher wages, and believe it or not, lower consumer prices. So it's not a bad thing. Um, related to that issue, the second issue, is the trade deficit. 
Uh, lots of political points are very often scored with talking about trade deficits, especially in the political context of China and Mexico. And they always bucket the two countries together. Let me be as clear as I can. Mexico is an economic ally of this country. China is a competitor. As was said earlier, 40% of the content of anything that we typically build uh, in Mexico is American-made content. By comparison, only 4% of things coming in from China have American content. And when you over look at the overall trade deficit that we have in our nation today, we are essentially at a trade equilibrium, or very close to it with Mexico. Yeah, we have a trade deficit. But we're, given the whole number, pretty close to a trade equilibrium with Mexico. Not so with China. Very, very big trade imbalance, no doubt. The state of Texas actually has a $12 billion trade surplus with Mexico. Texas does very well in its trading relationship with our southern neighbor. And then finally, the third bucket, of course, <laughs> is the whole issue of immigration. And once again, safety, as I started my comments. Ladies and gentlemen, and, and I, I say this all the time, if you want to destabilize the border, if you want to make our southern border unsafe, the quickest and surest way to do that is to take away the 286,000 jobs that have been created in Ciudad Juarez over the course of the last 20 some years. That symbiotic relationship also creates jobs on our side of the border, as I said, and I made through my prior comments, all over the country. Imagine abrogating NAFTA or imposing a border adjustment tax, and imagine the devastation that would have on employment in Ciudad Juarez and other parts of Mexico. And you want to destabilize an economy? That's the quickest and surest way to do it, is to destabilize that tight symbiotic relationship we have an integrated economy with our southern neighbor. The unemployment rate see the quietest suburbs around 3%. 24 years ago it was much, much higher. I think it was three times that. Here in El Paso, the unemployment rate prior to NAFTA was in near double digits, if not in double digits. Today it's 4.6%. So when you take away hope and opportunity and jobs, I guarantee you, people will always wait, find a way to support their family. Sadly, some will turn to violence. And I don't care if you have a 50-foot wall. They will go around it, go over it, surmount any kind of physical barrier in order to provide for their families. That's just the way it is. And the final comment I have is for the Mexicans, according to Pew Research, the last three years, probably four years now in a row, there is in fact reverse migration, more Mexicans moving back to Mexico than there are coming to the United States. Those are the economic and, 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 and demographic realities. So these are the things that, uh, that we need, again, to, to educate our population about across our country. Thank you. you. You've got me worried about the robots. Do they have them editing magazines yet? Or am I, am I safe? <laughs> All right, okay. Paul, you want, who knows? Um, Paul, just a final thought, and then we do, we do want to open things up. Thank you for your patience. Okay, and in, in, in reflecting on your, your question about kind of what brought us here, and what, and you, you sort of look back, and the, uh, unfortunately, it's mostly political, and the politicians like to create fear, and so they have us a frame of, well, terrorism for one, and for good reason, we shouldn't be afraid of terrorism, but they have us believing that all these terrorists are lined up on the border and they're going to come across, and I don't know where that happening, but I suppose it could. Um, also, with respect to the wall and, and, and drugs, I think they actually want people to believe that if you build a wall high enough, people in the U.S. will quit taking drugs. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's just not a realistic argument, but they really, I think, they want us to believe it. Or they want us to believe it. Um, and so they have us, they create this fear of, if you don't build a wall, your kids are going to take drugs, and terrorists are going to 
across the border, and um, and and plus they're not they're going to take all of our jobs, and they're draining the the coffers of our of our school systems, and 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 it just goes on and on and on. But it's all politicians stoking fear, and and unfortunately it ends up being politicians stoking uh, hatred. And, and if not hatred, at least um, um, a dislike of our, of our neighbors to the south. And it's 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 unfortunate, and it's up to us to to correct the misperceptions and to communicate them as, as as well as we can. So I want to take some questions from the audience. We started a little bit late, so is it okay if we like do ten minutes or so of of questions? Thank you. Just raise your hand if you'd like to ask one, and we will do our best to answer. Okay. And please just tell us your name and, and then state your question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Moore, and I uh, can fulfill a lifelong fantasy of grilling Alfredo for chocolate tonight. So. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just want to raise the, sort of the news of the day in context with, with what we've been talking about with the renegotiation of NAFTA. You know, President Trump uh, has, uh, uh, if you believe Director Comey, raised uh, concerns about how the Russian investigation is casting a cloud over what the administration is trying to do. I'm just curious from your perspective, uh, what does uh, sort of the, the distraction or the crisis or whatever that the administration is going through with the Russian investigation, how does that impact uh, the, the reopening of NAFTA and, and does that weaken the United States uh, hand in the negotiations and strengthen Mexico and Canada's hands? Thanks, Bob. Uh, Bob is the editor of the El Paso Times. So. <laughs> um, I think, I think the more time that, uh, that Mexico has to sort of find its footing, uh, the better. And I also think that they're beginning to realize that believe uh, not what he says, but what he does. And so uh, I think the whole Comey thing just continues to sort of weaken him and, uh, for now and, and, and helps Mexico get its more, more of its act together. I mean, I think, I think the Mexicans were kind of caught up hard last year. And so they're, they're just trying to find their footing. And, and uh, we had an interview with the, uh, the, the Mexican ambassador recently. And he was saying, telling us that, you know, and, and Karen and John have said this, I mean, the, the times have really changed in the last couple of months. I mean, it's, it's, it's a much different uh, cloud out there. It's, uh, it's sunnier, as, as John said. Um, can I, I, I just want to go back to Brian's quick point of why the fear? And I think, you know, I, it makes me kind of reflect as a journalist for, for the last 25 plus years. I've, uh, among the, the, the issues that I, walk, that I usually cover, there's, there have been two that I think uh, it's kind of helps or, or makes, uh, makes you reflect on, on America. So I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican born. Um, but it makes you reflect on Americans' two main vices, you know, the uh, demand for illegal drugs and the demand for illegal workers. Uh, and so it's migration and drugs, and that's something that uh, uh, you, you go back to, at, you know, whether it's the Midwest, whether it's California, it's people coming, uh, sort of coming to deal with reality on, on those issues. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Cindy Higgins. I'm with the El Paso Equal Voice Network. And I wanted to comment on the renegotiation of NAFTA. We've worked a lot around the Trans-Pacific Partnership and some of the inequalities that we saw reflected there. And I wanted to point out that all three countries, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, have always been engaged in trade. And, you know, although we were the number one city in the nation to lose jobs, 35,000 to be exact, and although it did take us some time to recoup, if you could call what we have now as a recoup. Um, the problem with NAFTA and our hope as far as labor rights and environmentalists and workers um, is that the ISDS court system get um, booted out. I mean, essentially the, ISD, the ISDS court system is three corporate lawyers deciding on the regulations if they exist between the countries. And what we've seen time and time again is if you're an environmentalist trying to push for protections, you're getting sent to court with the ISDS court system. 
and they're ruling on behalf of the corporations. What we see time and time again with farm workers are losing their land. And so, you know, I guess here to the audience more so as far as a comment goes, please, I do encourage each of you to participate in the public comment section. You have till Monday, and please share the real stories, the faces of this community, because we did lose our jobs, and we did lose the, our grounding. And please mention that it's not just about, about jobs, it's about the environment. I just came I'm, from- I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do, you. do you have a question, or if not, yes, please go uh, to the next one. Question. Um, I just came from the F in Mexico City, where about 300 participants were there from Canada, Mexico, and the United States, labor, indigenous, environmental workers. And we presented our concerns, and I do have in hand a declaration that we prepared. And my question, I guess, is specifically to Paul Oster. What sort of benefits do you see happening in the renegotiation as far as oil and trade regulations are concerned? Thank you. Um, well, actually, that's, that's a very good question. With, with the Mexican energy reforms, uh, you're seeing a lot of activity, a lot of change in the way energy is delivered to to Mexico, and, and in fact, uh, the, the trade goes both directions. Um, the U.S. gets a lot of approval from Mexico, and always has. Um, we deliver a lot of product to uh, to Mexico. Uh, the change is that we used to always deal with Pemex, or essentially with the government, and now with all the changes, it's, it's private business, and so. Uh, Everybody's kind of jockeying right now, trying to figure out exactly where their what their role is, including Pemex. Pemex is is sort of deer in the headlights right now, trying to figure out exactly what their role is long term in, in energy uh, transactions or in, in the energy business. Um, I think that the changes are very positive, both for the U.S. and Mexico. I think it's positive. Uh, for the sort of energy complex uh, of the world to, to open that up and have it be more of a free trade environment. Um, and, and I don't know if I've addressed your question, but but um, I, I am excited. I was going to say energized. That sounds like <laughs> but I am excited about about the fact that that, uh, that Mexico has entered into these reforms. And, and by the way, not just with respect to energy, but labor, teachers. Unions, a lot of things that are being reformed, taxes, which are very significant, um, and, and so Mexico is making great progress. And, and uh, one of the one of the big concerns I have, frankly, is I'm afraid Mexico is going to elect a, a leftist president. And uh, I think that the U.S. has some great vulnerabilities if that happens. And I think that uh, that we can bear some of the responsibility as well if that happens. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add? There's a couple of points that I would like to clarify, basically, with regards to Chapter 11, which is the investor state, that contains the investor state dispute settlement mechanism. First and foremost, investments require um, an environmental impact assessment study before they are actually undertaken. So I need to clarify that for the record. Number two would be Sincerely, the dispute settlement mechanism is established to protect the company or the, the investors against arbitrary acts of government. Um, and there's a procedure for that. And so part of the benefits that NAFTA brought to Mexico was the introduction of institutions and transparency and processes and rule of law. Now, I think we've grown and we've certainly benefited from these clear rules that allow economic actors to establish business partnerships and create jobs on both sides of the border. Is there room for improvement? Clearly, um, that we need to work them out together. And then thirdly, through the transparency measures and some of the issues that were introduced in TPP, for example, you know, sunshine is the best antiseptic. So if there's an arbitrary act of government, then you should have recourse towards it. So I have good news and bad news. Um, the bad news is that we only have time for one more question in this forum. The good news is that immediately after this, we're going to have a reception back there. And my hope is that the conversation will continue and we'll all stick around and, and continue this conversation. So um, one 
more. Can we do it down here at the front? Uh, my name is uh, Laura Vara from Love Hotel Center, or Love Juarez. It's a nonprofit in Juarez. And the question is going back a little bit to what um, Paul Foster was saying earlier. Regarding the election, I mean, the question is obviously, you know, speculation, but next year we have presidential elections in Mexico. Do you think that's going to affect, you know, the whole Mexico US relationship? Or do you think, I mean, whoever wants to answer the question, do you think that's going to be? You know, pretty much headed towards the same direction. What are your opinions on that, you know, as far as next year's elections? I could take a quick stab at this as somebody who follows Mexican politics pretty closely. And I was just in Mexico City last week, and we talked to um, more than one presidential candidate. We'll put it that way. And, um, you know, it was interesting to me, just to give a specific example, Jorge Ramos of Univision, who famous, became famous here because of his confrontation with President Trump at that press conference in 2015, had an interview recently with uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador, who's the, the left-leaning candidate in, in that election and whom many think the third time might be the charm for him and that he might win, especially if you know, the confrontation between the Washington and Mexico City becomes even tougher. So I watched this interview, and it was a half-hour interview that Jorge Ramos did with Lopez Obrador. And for the first half of the interview, for 14 minutes, they only talked about one thing, and it was corruption. It actually had nothing to do with the United States, which actually I think is a useful lesson for those of us who kind of follow Latin America from the US, which is that most of the time it's actually not about us, <laughs> right? And so, you know, it seems to me that what happens in DC and how the NAFTA negotiation goes and whether there's a well and what happens with the rhetoric about that, it will be an important factor in the Mexican election, but not necessarily the most important factor, or not even necessarily one of the top three, because there's, there's separate issues going on down there. I mean, is anybody here, I mean, Alfredo, you're a Mexico City-based guy, at least for the next couple of weeks. Uh, what, do you, what would you add to that? I would, uh, I would say a lot depends on what happens next. I think if you have uh, what Trump has promised, massive deportations, if you see a wall going up, I think it will have a, an impact in Mexico. And I think Mexico for the last 30 years has sort of put, put away the, the nationalism, the patriotism. And they, they said, okay, let's, let's try to be different. Let's try to be North American. Um, but you, you, but the, the anti-legal thing is, is still there. I mean, it's, it's, it hasn't gone away. It's, it's kind of hidden. And it's an election year. If you start, Going after uh, Mexicans and 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 it's and it's actually it's not just rhetoric. Uh, I I think it does uh, it it does help uh, uh, Lopez Obrador uh, just good or bad. I mean I'm I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking a position, but we we interviewed uh, Margarita Zavala also when we were in Mexico recently in Mexico City, and she was talking about the same thing that uh, that so far Mexi Mexicans have shown a lot of tolerance for the United States. Uh, but there is this fear that nationalism may break and may, and may come out. And we still don't know who the, uh, the pre-candidate is. So that also uh, will, will play a factor. So from my point of view, and completely nonpartisan, is we have a clear example in the US after having invested you know, numerous years and not to talk about the resources that were devoted into TPP negotiation to have come to an agreement and then have a new government and say, well, I don't like it. And that's just the risk, um, regardless of who gets elected. And so hence, from our point of view, it is, what do you want? Let's see if we can come to a constructive, positive agreement. I think that is the attitude where we're coming from. And, um, well, look, I think we've covered a lot of ground tonight. I want to thank our panelists. Um, it was kind of like a, like a couple's session in the end. So I think it was, it was good for all of us, I think. I feel, personally, I feel better about the, the relationship going forward. I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I want to thank you for coming out, uh, for reading the magazine as well. If, as you 
digest it here in these next few days. If you have any thoughts about what we did tonight or about the stories in here, um, my email address is on page three, and I hope you'll email me there. Thank you for being here. And a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.